Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Derek Smith. I'm a professor in the Department of Literature at Claremont McKenna College and currently the chair of the Interdepartment, Intercollegiate Department of Africana Studies here at the Claremont Colleges. And I wanted to welcome you to the 34th Sojourner Truth Lecture. We are honored to have with us this afternoon Allison and Leslie Saar, two sisters whose life work has made our world more beautiful and more complex, whose artistic projects are invested with the liberatory sensibility that animated the life of Sojourner Truth herself. And because of her unconquerable commitments to ideals of liberation, equality, and justice, Truth has, of course, inspired countless works of art. Many of those works seek to capture the likeness and the power that inspirited such a woman. And we're brought together this afternoon in this strange virtual circumstances that th these strange virtual circumstances that have now become so normalized to us to hear the words and experience the creative power of two artists who follow in the expansive path that truth began to forge some 200 years ago. Despite the unusual and challenging circumstances that we've endured for the last 12 months or so, we, the Department of Africana Studies here, were determined to continue the tradition of the Sojourner Truth Lecture. And although we deliberated for it, uh, about it for a little while, it now seems that we couldn't have made any other decision. It's only fitting that an event honoring a woman like Truth would easily move past the relatively minor obstacles that we now face. For the last 34 years, we've honored Truth's legacy by training our focus on the words and the wisdom and insight of Black women who have made significant contributions to the world of ideas that we all inhabit. And we do this again this afternoon with Allison and Leslie Saar who will offer our lecture. They'll be introduced by my colleague, Alicia Bonaparte, a, so a sociologist at Pitzer College. And following the lecture, we will have a short question and answer session. And if you could, during the lecture, place your questions in the particular area which is designated for questions, we will read those out at the end of the lecture, and then we'll get some response from uh, Leslie and Allison Saar. So without any further ado, I want to hand it over to Dr. Bonaparte. Thank you so much for being with us this, this afternoon. And I look forward to joining with you all in the experience of the lecture that we'll have this tonight. Thank you, Dr. Bonaparte. Thank you so much, Derek. So good afternoon and thank you to everyone for joining us for what I'm sure will be an engaging and thought provoking series of talks. This, the womb is the source of creativity and life according to Yoruba cosmology. Therefore, it is no eerie coincidence that both Leslie Saar and Allison Saar continue the legacy of their mother Betty Saar's contributions of innovative and visceral works of art. To be clear, each artist has their own distinct style and works in different media to provide eye-opening lenses of examining subject matter in the areas of race, gender, beauty, mythology, and more. Leslie Saar is a mixed media artist and painter who has exhibited internationally and nationally, and her work is included in museum collections such as the Kemper Museum, CAM, the Ackland Art Museum, and MOCA. Most recently, Leslie Saar's work is featured at the Crocker Collection, at the Crocker Art Museum alongside Allison Saar and Betty Saar. Leslie Saar is an award-winning artist whose most recent work examines the complexities of identity and mythology. I must say that I am in love with Zerbenta Dambala, born under the shade <laughs> of a black willow tree in New Orleans in 1826, sat on a rock <laughs> turning rain into tobacco smoke, which is currently featured at the Crocker. The Walter Maysill Gallery recently closed with their exhibition titled A Conjuring of Conjurers. On the other hand, we have Alison Saar. Alison Saar is a sculptor, mixed media and installation artist. Her artwork focuses on the African diaspora and black female identity and is influenced by African, Caribbean, and Latin American folk art and spirituality. 
Her sculptures, installations, and prints explore issues of gender, race, heritage, and history. She also is an award-winning artist. She most recently concluded a show at Scripps College's Williamson Gallery titled Mirror Mirror and has an exhibit at Bentu Museum of Art at Pomona College titled Of Ether and Earth. I will also say that I'm particularly intrigued to see what her sculpture of Yemenja will look like as I have a very special affinity for the goddess. Today, we will learn from these creative masters and I don't use that term lightly. So please join me in welcoming both Leslie Saar and Allison Saar, our 2021 Sojourner Truth lecturers. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Well, hello. Okay, I'm Leslie Saar, and Derek, I so appreciated your eloquent introduction. That was beautifully written. And thank you, Alicia, for all your kind words. Um, and I'm really honored to be included in this lecture, and especially how a lot of my themes can kind of coincide with um, Sojourner Truth's mission, as far as depicting people from history and imagine who uh, have expo um, experienced exploitation or marginalization or just the other in general. So I'm going to go ahead and begin my slide presentation. There we are. Um, I'm going to focus on the last uh, few series I've had, uh, maybe in the last 10 years. And this one here is a painting from my Mad Woman in the Attic series where I, uh, I examine uh, insane heroines from 19th century literature, as well as the very odd and poetic types of diagnosis they had for mental illness during the 19th century. So this piece here, this large painting is entitled Religious Melancholia, which actually was a diagnosis. They had very strange diagnoses then, um, such as melancholia, passing into mania, and they also had very interesting cures, such as like drinking water from uh, a skull to cure epilepsy and just odd things like mirrors and smokes and very mysterious and, and um, interesting cures and just kind of examining, um, you know, just how <clears throat> women and um, as depicted in these novels were usually um, sort of like victims or heroines, but when the women actually went insane, they gained agency and wrecked havoc and were kind of very um, pioneering and strong in their own way and gained agency. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, this is from my Monad series. And this piece is entitled Not Born Under a Rhyming Planet. And this is kind of reflecting on um, my interest and studies and metaphysical and um, theosophy and mysticism and esoteric, uh, esoteria. So what I've done was taken the notion of as above, so below, meaning that from the most minutest cell to a human being, to earth, to the galaxy and everything, the universe, there is a pattern that is replicated, a spark, a monad, which is what monad means. And so I, I had this idea and I'm like, okay, well, how am I gonna actually do it? And I thought, well, let's just sort of take this notion of from the um, minuscule to the you know, magnified, that it's the same thing. So I made these tiny cells, like they're sort of writing on this gondola, which is a depiction of a tiny skin cell and um, reverse the scale of um, from large to small and sort of turn things uh, upside down and bouleverse and, um, also dealing with time as past and present, I like to um, deal with things that I'm interested in currently and set them in a Victorian era. So I'm dealing with like the futurism and the past and notions of um, concepts of arbitrary concepts of time and space and scale. And this is another one from that where she's sort of like floating through the universe on this cellular planet. It's fitting the whole screen. And this one is called Cell Realization. And um, I guess you'd say like in all of my work, there's an element of surrealism because with through, through surrealism, I think it's a good vehicle for questioning things. So whenever a lot of my stuff, I'm just sort of questioning uh, 
you know, what is true, what is an uh, arbitrary construct, what is, you know, um, the searching for truth. And so uh, I um, wanted to have this sensation of sort of hurling through the universe, but at the same time, a stillness. In general, a lot of my portraits are quite still. Then the series that I did after that was called Gender Renaissance, Gender Renaissance which was done, uh, when did I do that? Like in 2017. And um, they were a series of banners and smaller paintings where I was questioning the mm, binary and arbitrary notion of gender. And this was inspired by my transgender son, my young transgender son, Sir Jen. So um, it's a personal thing. It's something that's very contemporary as far as a contemporary issue. But then again, I'll set it back in the past because it's not like this is a new thing. This has been going on for since the beginning of mankind. Um, so this, this banner here, it's called Miss Pearlie, the Transcontinental Mind Reader. And often I'll use an image of a person with albinism sort of as a metaphor for myself being so light-skinned or white passing. Um, I use it as a metaphor to question what is race is it as you are perceived by others or persecuted by others? Or is it how you yourself are within your background, your DNA, your history, your essence of who you are? And it's a combination of both. So it's just a question. It's just it's questioning it. This also is from the Jenner Renaissance series where I like to go from large scale. The banner that you just saw was like, um, like 85 inches, uh, 85 inches uh, tall. And this is a really small portrait called It's My Nature, which is only like 21 inches tall. And I have combined images of nature and symbols of masculinity and femininity and presented a trans um, man here. Um, just the images of notion are a way for me to question or say, well, what is nature? What is one's true nature? This one is called Forbidden Fruit, and I'm really in the Gothic stuff. <laughs> I just like the sensibility, the melancholia, the, the dark beauty of it. And so I wanted to get back to sort of this notion of um, Adam and Eve and um, biblical gender and that kind of thing, and perhaps do a portrait where it's maybe not so binary, oh, it's a trans man or a trans woman, it's just a person. And so this uh, portrait was um, <clears throat> one that was sort of like a step in a direction towards symbolism, which I'm now quite interested in as, as also employing uh, surrealism. And now we're moving into my more recent exhibition, which was A Conjuring of Conjurers. And this is the one, they all have really long titles. So. Now, if I repeat the title that Alicia just said, uh, this is Zerpanta born under the shade of a black willow tree in New Orleans in 1826, sits on a rock turning rain into tobacco smoke. And so the concept of a conjuring of conjurers actually had to do with creating one's own reality. But they're like, okay, I've got this idea. How do I manifest that? And I said, oh, well, I'll just sort of go back to roots of hoodoo and voodoo and um, Allie and our grandfather is from uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana. So that whole storytelling essence is within our history, our family history. And so I created all these conjurers and the whole exhibition was like these conjurers were conjuring this scene, these tableaus. And I wrote stories for, e for each of them and made up names, made up names from the stories. They're not actually from um, any kind of religion or uh, this is another large banner that I uh, did and this one is Melizus the mulatress lingered at the bottom of a deep sonorous well and as the moon percolated above she steamed nonchalant miracles so um I'm partial to eggs when I was 13 years old I had a huge egg collection so I often use them as symbols in my in my work and this is a, a smaller painting. This one's titled, Essant did not like reality. So he built his own dream of the census fortress 
which ultimately was a disappointment. And this explains his love of tragedy. And this was actually based on a book that I had read with the character Des Essences. It's a uh, 18th century French novel called Against Nature, where the heroine, um, he becomes a recluse from society and just sort of creates his own realm of the census fortress where he just delves into things like flowers and scents and taste and literature and art. And often I feel like that. I mean, especially now everybody must feel like that with the pandemic, but um, I'm kind of a hermit and just stay home and do my work and um, try to be surrounded by things that I love. In this show, A Conjuring of Conjurers, I also created these totem structures who are also conjurers. In the center is the large banner. And this is Septim, a collector of breezes, hoarder of voices and gatherer of olfactory ephemera, once changed her lover into a lake to protect him. And surrounding her, the one on the left screen, is Paone, master of the direction of space and time, got blood out of a turnip yesterday from a stone he stepped on tomorrow. And then the conjurer on the right is Fern Nest, the raggedy guardian of the shrines hidden deep in the forest where large clay pots filled with hair and nail clippings collect rain, water, and leaves. So kind of my idea in this show was sort of to create these tableaus where the works could kind of work off of each other. And along with all of the titles and histories behind the, the conjurers would sort of create their own stories that, I don't know, the viewer could, could imagine. And um, yeah, it's kind of fashion. I just was interested in fashion. So it was just stuff I had around the house, like old uh, keys or hourglasses and uh, bits of things from nature like sponges and dried sticks and scraps and at this weird furry thing on the um, right is like a beard from some old theater troupe and um, the heads I did out of this um, polyfoams I sort of wanted to be like um, ephemeral smoke coming out uh, instead of their heads just sort of to give the illusion of, um, of the mysterious for the conjuring aspect. Um, this here is Yasa, a trickster who lives in every corner of the forest. Sometimes she appears as a goat with a woman's head passing in and out of the visible world, partaking in ridiculous orgies. And this one, she's uh, Nasida. Her whole story is Nasida is a hit or miss mind reader. Sometimes tears trickle from her ears when she is overwhelmed by the inner feelings of others. So I was just sort of interested in um, the idea of the negative. So I did this portrait as though it were a black and white negative, just um, based on my own personal history and how I look, I'm always sort of doing things that, 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 that question and deal with the notion of race. And that was just some other type of questioning. So the last one I have that's from this uh, Conjuring of Conjuring series, this is, Olfida, the abandoned bride, finds books in broken branches, sermons and stones, rituals and roots, and sagas and silent seas. So she had her own room. And you know, um, yeah, I'm always just having images of nature and just all sorts of things juxtaposed. And I put like this old dried up bulb and during the exhibition it started sprouting. <laughs> so weird, like no water or anything just started growing on its own. Okay, these are, last two are from a new series that I have coming up, which is called Black Garden, and it's for um, an exhibition I'm going to have at very small fires in Seoul, Korea. And um, yeah, so these are from this year, from 2021. And um, the sh title of the show is Black Garden, and it's a series of portraits inspired by an early poem by Antonin Artaud. And although it's not like a literal translation of the poem, they're just sort of impressions from this dark, beautiful, gothic, surreal, symbolic work, work written in like 1915. And again, I've like juxtaposed images from nature, biology, anatomy, and assorted uh, vintage objects. Um, you know, uh, just sort of like sprouting out of the heads of these people or floating about in a sort of melancholic Gothic atmosphere. 
And the images are, are like just sort of a metaphor for the subject's thoughts, like their consciousness, their truths, their forms like um, changing as they're sort of growing in the garden. And here's another one from that series. Oh, I'm sorry, the title for this one. So the titles are all sort of lines from the, the poem. And so this one was of the luminous hour glittered strange. And then my uh, last painting also from a black garden. Oops. Uh, this one is titled, they have blossomed from the lands of death. These flowers, which long wrought dream has poured. So. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Very cool. Well, should I just hop in then? Let me go into my share screen and we're going to grab this gal. And then we're going to do the slideshow. Yeah, so it's always interesting looking and listening to Leslie talk about her work because it brings to mind all of our parallels and uh, kind of where we come converge and where we depart. And so um, this is um, a piece called Breach. Um, um, I guess in 2015, I went to um, New Orleans to uh, do residency at the Joan Mitchell Center there. And it was still really overwhelming to see how much had been left and neglect, continued to be neglected in the communities in the aftermath of Katrina. And I would ride my bicycle through the Treme to, um, to the French Quarter every day on where my studio was. And you know, house after house still had these X's on it. And it was just really heartbreaking when you remember all the promises that were made to how New Orleans was gonna be built bigger and better and brighter than ever. And of course that just meant whiter than ever. And many of those people still are not able to return to their homes. And so I became really interested in the history of flooding and the African-American um, history. And instead of focusing on Katrina, I went and looked back at the great Mississippi flood of 1927, which um, flooded from Vermont to, uh, <laughs> to the Gulf basically. And it was really uh, the sh black sharecroppers that were really put um, at the greatest uh, peril. And you could look at images. There's some really beautiful photos of that, of them being stranded on their levees. And then you put it side by side with the images of um, the black communities in New Orleans that were stranded on the um, freeway overpasses. And it just was really startling to me how um, the policy has not changed in terms of people of color and pe poor people are living in um, nature's flood zones and in harm's way. And how when they do get struck by disasters, they are the last to receive any help or assistance or they have no options or no places to go. So I did this peace breach and um, it's basically, um, you know, this sort of um, river, figure. Um, she is basically balancing everything she owns upon her head. And so it talks about vulnerability and also the strength and the means of survival as well. So she goes up about 14 feet tall. And then this piece is also from that series. Um, and it's called um, silted brow and it was kind of a um a memorial to all of those um that have passed and who have been you know succumbed to flooding and rivers um basically overtaking the lands and then i did a show called topsy-turvy at la louver which is my gallery here in los angeles and um you know i think it would, had been building up i usually try to have my work have some sort of um um, I guess wanting to have some sort of affirmative or some sort of positive sort of <laughs> glimmer of hope. <laughs> and I think it was really a difficult time for me to kind of push beyond that. You know, we were just at the beginning of, um, you know, a lot of the surveillance in terms of um, Blacks being killed throughout the country. I mean, that's not that it was anything new, it's just that we finally had means to turn the surveillance back upon them. And, um, and so it was a really anxious time as it continues to be a real anxious and infuriating time. And I just was filled with rage. And so this actually, this piece called High Cotton was, um, 
kind of a response to the audio that was released of Philanda Castile's girlfriend, and you can hear their daughter in the back of the car, her daughter in the back of the car. And um, the, you know, I just, you could hear the trauma in her voice and he tried to imagine who this little girl is gonna grow up to be. And so what I wanted to do was instill a power. I mean, Leslie, when you're talking about um, how we gain agency in our madness in some ways, I feel in some ways we also, you know, when pushed to the brink become stronger. And so I was hoping that, you know, I was wishing a future where this child and other children that have witnessed similar um, murders and massacres of their parents um, or their friends or themselves um, out there and how they could kind of push beyond that trauma and become stronger and healthy and wonderful um, people, but also to have the wherewithal to fight back. And so this is called High Cotton. And so it's five young girls kind of um, each having a tool of the five props, uh, classic props of the um, slave trade. So we have uh, rice with the sickle and cotton with the hay bale hook. I think that's tobacco all the way back with the tobacco knife and uh, sugar with the sugar cane and the hoe was for indigo. And so they have these cotton bowls tied to their hairs, their hair, their braids, because they're basically um, using the cotton as their camouflage as they're coming to the field to kind of bring down the master's house. And then this piece is called White Guys. I also imagine, uh, I think Leslie and I both kind of do a lot of work in terms of trying to, um, you know, also recognize that we are very fair skinned and that we are perceived as being white. And in some ways we're privy to some incredible things being said because we are perceived as being white. And um, so I thought um, um, often how slaves would be um, biracial or have very light skin. Often they're often the offspring of the master of the house and, and the slave. And so um, what I wanted to do was have her be a, a spy in the house, in the big house sort of thing. And so um, she's there and kind of informing the girls outside in the field as to when would be a proper time to pull a raid. Um, and so she too has her weapon. She's got uh, this iron and you can't really see it, but if you look really closely, you'd see this little drop of blood on the tip of her iron. Um, and then this piece is called Topsy and the Golden Fleece. I think it's interesting how, again, how Leslie and I have, uh, refer to literature a lot in our works. Um, she more so, I think, you know, she really came out of a strong literary background. But um, for me, I kind of was interested in the story of, Topsy's role in Uncle Tom's cabin is this kind of sassy, you know, problematic little girl and how they're constantly trying to bring, you know, Jesus to her and bring God to her and religion to her to kind of change her evil ways. And, you know, I think, um, you know, it was written, Heritage is just still kind of wrote this as an abolitionist novel, but then, you know, in the hands after afterwards, the image of Topsy became a derogatory image and, um, you look at films and um, even plays that were done, Topsy somehow steps forward and frontwards because it was a caricature that they could kind of make a very derogatory imagery of. And so I kind of, again, wanted to have uh, Topsy claim her wildness. And um, at the, in one point in the book, I guess, little Eva with her golden blonde hair, which was basically, you know, I you know, they alluded it to having kind of this magical power, this light, this luminescence. and when she's dying and all the slaves are gathered around um, the bedside, she starts doling out strands of her golden precious hair to, to the slaves. And you know, again, this is thought to be symbolic of her handing out Christianity um, to, to the heathens. And um, I imagine that, you know, Topsy kind of figured out, well, if her power is in her blonde golden hair, um, I don't want a few strands, I'm just gonna take the whole thing. So here she is, she's basically scalped little Eva and is holding her, her scalp. And so it's called Topsy and the Golden Fleece. Um, and so then this was kind of the work that I uh, just recently exhibited in a show at um, Freeze Art Fair. Um, and I called the show Chaos in the Kitchen and it was really kind of, I think after all of this, um, these two shows, um, you know, kind of talking about sort of Katrina and kind of, again, kind of using historical imagery 
but talking about contemporary issues through kind of these tales of historical characters and, and um, histories. I was really interested in trying to come to, to something that felt like home. And I think, um, you know, it was, that was kind of where I started to find some solace and some sort of comfort in those memories of home. And so this whole piece was kind of looking at um, the kitchen and how the kitchen was a place that, you know, my mother's generation couldn't wait to get out of and how I really have such great fond memories of being in the kitchen, both our kitchen at home, which was also my mother's studio um, and our space where we did our homework and all of our art projects, but even my grandmother's kitchen. And it was a place where, you know, all the aunts would come together and various things. And so this piece is called Congoline Resistance, um, Stubborn and Kinky. So I was kind of trying to play off of the old pomade tins and talking about hot comb culture and all of that. And then, um, so actually I started um, whittling, which is the first time I, you know, I usually work in the scale is about six feet and sometimes larger for the public pieces. But I really felt again, kind of, you know, remembering how my mother used to make art in our kitchen in these really tiny spaces. I kind of, um, you know, had gathered all these beautiful old hot combs over the years and decided to kind of create these little hot comb hanks and this notion that you're using the hot comb to kind of take all the kink and the wild and stubbornness out of your hair. Where does that go? It's got to go somewhere. And so I decided these haints would kind of absorb all that energy until you're ready to re-embrace that wild side of yourself. So that's her. Um, and then I decided to do a giant version. And so this is a seven foot tall hot comb haint. Um, but again, the same story. And, you know, I wanted the bottom of her legs to be burnt because you know how the handles get all burnt from being on your stove and all charred and um, just really have fun. I guess it was kind of bittersweet because, you know, aside from, you know, if you're squirming too much, you'd either get smacked upside the head or burned behind the ears or something. But it was also just a really rich time to spend with my cousins who we didn't see very often. And um, I don't know, it was just a really wonderful, rich time with smells of whatever was cooking in the kitchen with the, 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 the smell of burning hair and sometimes burning flesh. <laughs> um, this piece is called Kitchen Amazon. And so again, I was kind of looking at Greek and Roman mythology and the story of the Amazon in the Odyssey and um, the queen of the Amazons and how she basically had this magic girdle and you know she was gonna gift this girdle and through some misunderstanding, um, basically um, um, the uh, Homer and his buds just decided to kind of like beat her, beat her to death. And so I kind of was interested in this idea of these sort of magical things, girdles and things. And it's also, you know, pays, uh, it's, a, it's a nod to um, Josephine Baker's banana skirt. But this notion of skillets and skillets have been really, they come and go in my work for a while, but I know that um, for me, they just have this beauty and in, in a weird sort of way, they're sort of this heirloom that they kind of has this residue of all these meals that have been cooked and shared. You know, sometimes they're passed on through the families. You get your grandmother's skillet. You're like, maybe, uh, you know, that was a good thing to get. And so I was really intrigued with that. And then how they also could become weapons. And so this is um, this, she's about six feet tall and her girdle itself weighs about 75 pounds or so. So it's, it's a little heavy, but um, yeah. And then the other one is held aloft um, as, as a weapon. And I think this is just a detail of all of these beautiful skills that I have collected. And I love that they all have these kind of crusty sort of testimonies to, um, to their past usage. And then this piece is called Set to Simmer. And I guess I'm getting back to my angry self at this one, but um, you know, it was kind of looking at the Odalisque and generally that was a, you know, a female figure, a concubine often that was portrayed by a, uh, a male, largely a white male, um, kind of, you know, towards the white male gaze. And I was kind of interest, intrigued with making one that was not geared towards the male gaze. And really, she, I mean, she's doing one major taboo. She's laying naked on the kitchen table, which is largely um, still, I think, not allowed in most um, households. But I also like this idea that the viewer had to sit in this chair and basically, you know, sit down and really look at her. And she's basically saying, yeah, I'm here. If you want to look at me, 
sit down and take a good look and drink this all in. And this idea that don't pretend you know me by looking askance out of the corner of your eye, or, you know, often in those paintings, there'll be someone lurking, you know, peeking behind this curtain sort of thing. But here she is, she's kind of um, exposed, but at the same time, she feels very confident in her own body and her own sexuality. And again, we have the skillet um, here, it doubles as the mirror, replaces the mirror in a traditional odaliste, but um, it is also a, a, a potential weapon. And then um, it was a collaboration I worked on with um, amazing poet, Dion Brand. And um, I remembered my mother, my grandmother's kitchen had um, this drawer in the pantry that was um, all of it, it's a catch-all drawer. And I'm assuming most people have that where it's like, you know, odd bits of string and your rubber bands and safety pins and keys to nowhere and whatnot. And so I'd collected all these objects and I'd asked Dion to write these little poems or whatever. I just said, you know, write things that can go within this drawer. And there are all these little snippets that kind of give some sort of um, view into her life. And, you know, it talks about, you know, the complexities of who we are and how we're not just this simple black body, but that we have, you know, really interesting feelings and we have mysteries and we have all those other things that everyone else has. And so I love this, that you kind of are invited um, to kind of go through her drawers. I, I know that Leslie uses puns a lot as well. And so this notion that you're invited to come and go through her drawers. Um, this was a print that I did over um, the, um, the last year while we were in isolation. Um, called Rise, and it was a response to Black Lives Matter, and we use it as a fundraiser for a few um, local organizations here in Los Angeles. And um, then this piece is called Blue Boy, and I was looking at uh, Ginsburg's uh, Blue Boy dressed in his blue satins and was kind of thinking that those blue satins at this foppish, um, not foppish, this, this dandy boy was wearing, um, were probably, um, you know, dyed by indigo that was being farmed and, and raised by slaves. And so um, in, in this case, he's, um, you know, instead of holding his hat, he's holding a heart and he has a rather large hoe over his shoulder and his skin has been dyed blue through the process of working on an indigo farm where basically you start taking on the color of your crop. And then um, these last couple of pieces, this one is called Torch Song. And I think, you know, uh, music, uh, I think where Leslie, I think kind of pulls from literature a lot. I also feel, um, find great inspiration in music. And so this was kind of talking about music as a weapon. And so I was playing, I had found these beautiful piano keys that someone had, you know, smashed up a piano and put it on the curbside and brought them home and had had them for a long time. And I thought, oh, they would make a fantastic bandolier kind of like a via, um, via uh, Pancho Villa. And so um, this idea that your music can be your weapon. And if you go back and look at songs and songs pieces such as Billie Holiday and Nina Simone and, um, Halia Jackson and all these women who had really powerful voices and really powerful songs and often songs would be cloaked in this idea of religious or love songs, but they also would also have these really strong political messages. And so that's who this girl is. And then this is a painting that was on a found um, coffee table top. She's quite big, she's about five feet tall. And I think Oh, and so this is the final piece. I thought we'd, since we started, um, we're talking about uh, Pomona and I have my show Ether and Earth that's up at the Benton at the moment, but this is the piece that the Benton Museum in Pomona College commissioned um, called Imbue. And, um, you know, for me, I am really uh, show a great deal of gratitude to Yumeya. And um, I feel that a lot of my creativity comes out of um, uh, the realm of the water. And so this is a water carrier and uh, the idea that um, water like knowledge will imbue your life with um, fertility and fortitude. And so that's where we'll leave it. I'm gonna close this up. I'm back. So, everyone unmuted. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Beautiful, Allison. Likewise.
Likewise, thank you. No, it's fun to see the work. And you know, we see, you've seen each other's work over the years, but especially to hear you talk and you say, oh yeah, you know, I forgot that, you know, your, your use of words and everything is just really inspiring. And um, I love that you play with language a lot. And I think that's really interesting to me as well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I always learn something, even though I, you know, we've done talks together, and I know you so well. And I mean, gosh, just just the history and just your eloquent, um, you know, just the way you work it into how you were inspired, you know, and the histories before, you know, behind the works and how it feels so authentic. And thanks. Well, I think <laughs> what Alicia was saying that you know, our all three of us have real you know, meaning my mother as well, you know, mm -hmm. your, you know, if you if your art is from your experience that we've all, many of us have experienced many of the same things, you and I, especially living in the same household and mm -hmm. all of them. But it's, yeah. you know, I think a tribute to, you know, the artistic mind that you can kind of take the same ingredients and come up with a very different thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Definitely. <laughs> well, I don't know, did we have any questions coming up? Thank you both so much for your presentations. And we have a few questions that have come in already and I hope that uh, people will feel free to um, add uh, whatever they like to the uh, discussion here. And uh, I'll ask a few of them. And you know, I, both, most of these questions are uh, directed at both, uh, 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 both of the presenters here. So, um, the uh, one question though specifically is for Leslie, it came in during your uh, presentation. And uh, this person was wondering how the stories that you share correspond uh, you know, with the uh, portraits in the Conjuring of Conjurers and, and how that is um, perhaps made evident when the collection is displayed, right? Is there some kind of way in which the uh, viewer might come to understand that connection? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yes, well, especially with the large totem conjurers, when I was making them, I, I did a lot of research. I think both Allison and I do a lot of re research um, when we come towards our work. And I might be like, oh, well, um, you know, this is someone that's um, from, from, from Africa where you've got the mixture of Catholicism and indigenous um, African, you know, uh, traditional African religions. And, um, you know, so I'll, I'll sort of start with like how I've made it, like uh, visually how it looks and then kind of come up with a story that re responds to that or I did. Um, there were certain kinds of correlations between like Russian folklore and hoodoo. And I thought that was really interesting. So one of them might have a more Eastern European vibe, you know, and then sort of make the story feel like it was coming from that, you know, part of the world. And, but, um, you know, it was so much fun to do these things because sewing is a lot easier than painting. I'm not traditionally trained. I didn't go to art school. <laughs> radio I mean I majored in broadcasting or communications so um sewing is just kind of like fun and it was more stream of consciousness throwing things together so it was really fun doing the titles and stories just kind of having them be these strange they all sort of related to these entities that had different powers and adding like ridiculousness to it and and um, historical facts uh, from hoodoo and voodoo and and different parts of the world where you just had people who were capable of changing reality. And so um, I don't know if someone would read the story and look at it and say, well, this directly makes sense. I kind of don't work that way. I sort of, um, I would love to be more uh, free, like the new musicians or avant-garde jazz or something, you know, I'm kind of tight, but my mind is always, I want to go to that free space and not have things too hammered down or, um, you know, linear in that sense. And I think that you spoke a little bit here uh, to one of the other questions, uh, Leslie, that uh, was asked about the uh, research process. Somebody is asking about the research process that goes into uh, the production of the art. You know, both of you are making reference to history and literature and music and so forth. So maybe Allison, if you could uh, tell us a little bit about that, that process, would you have much to say on that? 
Yeah, well, I think, you know, it's interesting coming out of Scripps, which was a really strong humanitarian humanities background and how, um, you know, while you're in the thick of it, it's hard to imagine where, how it's going to be useful for you. <laughs> and for me, it's kind of like the most important uh, portion of my education and that it's something I go back to again and again. And I'm really interested in, um, you know, mythologies, various mythologies, both Western and non-Western mythologies and how they do overlap. You know, I guess it always comes down to the sort of, you know, story that we all have the same needs and we all create same myths around the same needs and, and who we are. But um, I think often my research comes out of, um, you know, I'll come up with a word or a couple of words and I, you know, go into, you know, the dictionary and the thesauruses are also two of my best friends and kind of seeing the roots of words and those will then lead you to other places. And I just love this sort of venture that language can take you on and the research can just lead you to these really kind of incongruous thoughts and it creates this sort of poetic um, cobbling together of these different ideas and these different stories. How about yourself, Leslie? Is that how you kind of go about it or? Uh, yeah, I'll get some sort of idea. And you, a lot of times it's from my own life, like having a, a trans son or this um, same child of mine is also neurologically atypical. So I've done a series called Autist Fables based on all of the shenanigans of um, living with an autistic <laughs> child. Um, and then I try to make it more universal or just sort of not have it be like a, an exact translation of what's going on in my life but more like I present it metaphorically and um yeah so for gender renaissance I really researched trans people throughout history and the clubs they went to and um uh, terminology and and imagery and I use it for visuals I use a lot of old photos that are um I imagine um uh, in public domain you know and I often collage things to create I don't just do it kind of out of my head. So I do a lot of visual researching too. And um, I think one thing that I got from my mom, her being a, an assemblage artist and doing collages, is that sort of how I approach my compositions. I'll get these various things um, and collage it together for the composition instead of sketching it. I don't know, I like to really see what I'm going to do. So the painting, sometimes people say, was well, this all painted? Because it sort of has a collage. Um, like look to it. I'm getting a bit off topic, but I do a lot of uh, like visual research as well. <laughs> so we have another question coming in from uh, one of our historians here, and you know, very interested in the way in which history informs, of course, both of your uh, projects. And uh, a question about the relationship between the, the contemporary and the history. Is it as though you sort of look first to history and then sort of bring that idea into the present or are you kind of thrown back into the past, let's say by events in the contemporary. And, you know, so I just, I guess a little bit about like, um, how do the, the uh, ideas of, of history the, or the idea of history itself uh, sort of relate to your contemporary creation? Yeah, well, uh, I'll hop on that first. Um, yeah, I think in, in some ways, well, I mean, going looking going back to that piece of breach and how um, maybe even though our family is from New Orleans uh, or from Louisiana, I think they had moved out by the time um, the Great Mississippi flood had hit. But, you know, I didn't feel, I felt that it was a rawness and I didn't want to kind of contribute to sort of this sort of um, disaster tourism that was happening post Katrina. Um, and so I really felt that um, I needed to kind of like step back to a space before that and kind of look at the great Mississippi flood. And then, um, you know, we could then recognize how, even though this is a historical event, we are still living it very much in the here and now. And so I think, um, you know, I think that the persistence of these histories um, are really important in kind of the way I approach the work and that um, I feel, um, that distance creates a space where it is not necessarily telling someone's specific story again, because um, I don't feel right in telling someone else's story per se, but I'm very interested in kind of talking about how we're, this narrative is a continuum as well. So 
That's mm -hmm. why I kind of look at the past to talk about the future or the present. Leslie goes more into the future than I do. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I'm kind of the same as Alice. And I mean, I'll deal with, with what's going on in my life now, like um, having a trans son. That's really interesting, especially since I had to sort of um, go uh, with them all the time to the appointments and, and advocate for them, that kind of thing. And then for me, by setting it in another era, often it's sort of this antebellum era, which is just kind of going back to this colonialization and, and this influence of another uh, culture on another culture. Yeah, so much of these things can just go back to, to that, that time period and how much it informs what's going on now or is being repeated or just even the notion of, of gender in different countries is so different from uh, you know, Western yeah, concept of binary gender. And um, so often I'll just set things in that period. Um, I'm kind of kind of stuck on the Victorian or antebellum period, just to kind of get that extra, there's just these different layers. And just by sort of putting that extra thought there, like, oh, I guess this has been going on for a while, or, oh, this is giving me another kind of mood, like I'm in a movie or something that can be just sort of um, atmospheric. It could be like uh, political, it could be kind of cultural, it could be just odd, you know, just to make people's thoughts go in, or my own thoughts, <laughs> go in different directions. And, um, you know, I just wanted to say, I'm mean, just want, I usually say this sort of at the beginning, I'm so, so honored to be asked to be in this um, lecture with my sister. And I always feel, especially now, like we talked about um, being light skinned or white passing and how we hear a lot of stuff like we're a spy in the house of racism. But I also would like to acknowledge my privilege. And I think it's really important for light skinned people like ourselves to acknowledge that and to be very careful to not take up space or speak um, as if my reality is, I'm not putting it terribly eloquently, but not to sound um, self deprecating or anything, but I just always am like, wow, you want, you want me to be on this platform? You know, I mean, I'm honored, but man, you know, I feel like I should just just say something. It's just a lot of colorism going on and texturism. And um, I always feel at least by me saying that, that I'm acknowledging my privilege and trying to, I don't know, at least be aware and anybody watching, I'm just talking about my own little weird experience. I'm not speaking for everybody. Um, I know who I am, but I also know how I look and how I'm perceived by others and um, off topic, but I thought I'd throw it in. <laughs> You know, oh. my dog's gonna chime in on that. <laughs> He's like, what? <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with us, Leslie. I wonder if I can just follow up. I mean, it, it, it sort of links back to a point that you were making um, earlier about um, like surrealism in your in your art, and we have an interesting question about this relationship between surrealism and futurism. Do you see those as 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 you know, very different, or do they sort of flow into one another? If you could speak about the relationship, I, I think that would be fascinating. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I love the Sun, Sun Ra, you know, for instance, and just the king of, of, of futurism and Afrofuturism, and so far ahead at this time. And I, I do think that uh, futurism and Afrofuturism is quite surrealistic in nature, and just this whole notion of, um, not necessarily the future technologically, but just the future spiritually and, and the creation of other worlds beyond our sort of lower concrete, you know, mentality world. And um, so I like to go back and forth. And I guess in the Monad, Monad series, I wanted the palette was very um, different than what I usually use because it's not like a historic kind of palette. It's very day glow and how I would interpret futurism to be palette wise for the colors. And yet the uh, characters are dressed in uh, Victorian or antebellum outfits and um, just the surrealistic aspect of flipping the scale between a tiny cell and a big planet and flying through the universe. So I, I really think they're totally connected, yeah. I wonder if we, you bring it, you brought us into sort of like the materiality, the, the visual uh, element of the, of the uh, presentation uh, with that. And, you know, we've been a little bit more conceptual before that. And I wonder um, if we could think a little bit about like the process of creation here. We have a, a question that asks you about, uh, this is for both of you, but we could maybe go to Allison first, um, to describe the relationship between form and content in terms of like 
the ideas that uh, are informing the piece that you create? Do they, what is the relationship between those ideas and then the material thing that you are producing? Like, is there an element of improvisation in there? Do you just try and transpose ideas from your mind into the material? Or is there, you know, can you say a little bit about that dynamic process? Yeah, I mean, as much as I love improvisation and in, in music and uh, and um, theater world, I'm afraid as a carver, improvisation is, is problematic because you got to start with a start with something and make it work, sort of thing. So I don't improv so much at that point, but um, I do. I, I mean, when you were talking about materials and you were talking about content, and I think Leslie's also relates to Leslie's work as well, and that using found objects. And I think sometimes um, that's kind of where this other un, unseen hand or this game of chance comes in, in terms of what we can find and what is. Um, what make what objects and materials avail themselves to us and how um, you know I will be looking for some the other day I needed like a worn out broom for this piece and I just um, drove down a different street and I found it immediately so I have find stuff. <laughs> that things <laughs> like kind of find you if you kind of put out those sort of feelers to kind of look for st stuff or what you need and sometimes you don't even know what you're looking for but it'll come but I love the idea that you know, and we were talking about use um, these sort of vintage materials, which Leslie, I know, like you, especially in your sculptural pieces, you're using a lot. And you, I think even in your um, two-dimensional paintings where you're kind of um, cobbling kind of existing images as well, that those image, those um, objects have a history to them. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I first started doing that when I, when I was 27, when I moved to um, New York and was, got, uh, was working at the Studio Museum in Harlem. And when I'd walk and I'd see all these kind of piles of ceiling tin and it was just so beautiful. And the notion that, you know, it basically had witnessed and experienced, you know, a century of things, you know, mm -hmm. um, living and dying and having fish fries or rent parties or, you know, having sex and children being born, you know, they've been witnesses to all of that. So I love this idea that materials have the power um, and so a lot of times I'll find a material and that material will really definitely dictate what form it needs to be. I mean, I know that sounds a little hokey, um, you know, going back to, you know, um, is it Michelangelo that says, you know, that he was freeing the figure out of the stone sort of thing. But I really feel that these materials have a sort of power and sensibility that, um, that brings a lot to the table and um, take, brings a lot to the work, so. Mm -hmm. Oh, we lost your audio. You're on mute, Derek. <laughs> I'm still figuring out how to use Zoom. This is <laughs> um, so I have one a quick follow-up question um, uh, on that. We have somebody who wants to know, particularly Allison, about your use of rust and patina in uh, in the sculpture. And uh, is there, you know, sort of a a very deliberate way in which it's used? There, like, and how do you uh, manage that? Oh, well, for the pieces that are outdoors that are cast bronze, those patinas are kind of, um, you know, put together by in a collaboration with the foundries and they're all chemical patinas, which um, I also love that. It's very alchemic that, you, you know, you have this one material and you throw something else on it and it does something completely different. Um, but I'm also really interested in just like the tin pieces or the wood pieces of uh, the idea of sort of libations. And, you know, I think when I was working at Scripps with Dr. Samela Lewis, we were looking at a lot of um, art from their African collection, which is really wonderful to be able to actually touch and see these things. And mm -hmm. that's such a big part of those pieces. And their patina is by handling and by, you know, these pieces being handed to one person to the next and from one generation to the next. And so I really love that sort of surface. And so I tried to kind of go after that and always giving them a good rub down sort of thing. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, and, and, and Leslie, did you have anything to say about that relationship between content and you know, the content of the idea and the form that it ultimately takes in the process of creation and maybe improvisation as well? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, more so with doing uh, these banners because I'll use a lot of found embroidery, 
like one I'm working on now has like a, a clipper ship or something, which can be analogous to like slave ship or something like that. And um, just sort of by juxtaposing the various fabrics, you know, um, antique trims and just weird bolts of fabric I get at Joann's, like with all the other house brows shopping at Joann's and um, just kind of the juxtaposition of all the various fabrics. It can be, um, yeah, just, just as fun as I was saying before, because it's just sort of freer, doesn't take the same like skill sets as, a, as painting or, um, and you can just sort of play around by, by putting them down and thinking about it and coming back and, oh, this is giving me this connotation, that's not right. And I mean, it's improvisational in the doing of it, but I always take a few days to make sure it's like, oh no, this is saying this, this isn't what, I, you know, I don't want to say that. And just kind of coming back and looking at, because it takes a while to sew them. I'm not saying they're done in a minute, but um, the planning of it and yeah, that, that, that's definitely improvisational and how it's going to, I have already the idea of what I'm going to paint there and how that can be like Allison was saying, a backup story or just a history to itself, each found embroidery, just these different layers of history that can just sort of add more to the story uh, of the, the person that the portrait's being done. So I had a question for the both of you, if you don't mind me asking, is that okay? Oh, sure. Okay. Um, so the question that I had was, as you create each of the pieces, and I have to be honest, last night I watched the documentary on HBO Max, Black Art in the Absence of Light, and I saw Allison was in there as well. Um, and one of the things that I thought was so beautiful is that each of the artists was kind of talking about how things shifted and changed and how they moved through. And I was just curious for the both of you, like, how do you feel you've changed as, as an artist, right? Because you've been doing this for an extensive period of time now. So how do you feel like how you've changed as an artist? I'm just curious. You wanna go first, Alec? <laughs> oh gosh. You know, I think just as we develop, I know that, um, you know, the really early work, when I first moved to New York, I was very much fascinated with Harlem and histor the history of Harlem. And my, um, my great aunt's husband had been a Harlemite and had a, a restaurant in Harlem. And so I had this very, you know, sort of um, romantic notion of what Harlem was. And that was really what the work focused on at that point. And then I think I had my first child and that was a major shift for me because I became really interested in the spirit. And, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you have a kid and all, you know, where did this soul, where did this little spirit come from? And it really kind of, led me to think about the magic of the female body. And you started out talking about the womb, again, to hit on that womb. It's like, that's just an amazing machine. And so <laughs> for the, the work really took a, a shift there and really started to keep talking a lot about the female body. And, um, you know, every once in a while, I just recently actually did a series about um, Harlem again. But, you know, I think you can really track sort of my own experience through looking at the work. And so, you know, when I had kids and then when the kids were, you know, flying the coop, then I did a lot of empty nest paint pieces. And then, you know, now I'm doing some pieces that are talking about ageism because I got to think about that as well. And so, you know, I think as we live and we progress um, that I think the work develops in, in that respect. How about yourself, Leslie? I know you have different really mm -hmm. phases as well. Yeah, no. Um we're both so similar, Allison and I, in how we try to come from a point of what's going on in our lives and um, how that feels authentic to us, to something that we're truly interested in. And um, yeah, so maybe earlier on, it was just sort of um, things that I was interested in. I started doing these books and these altered books and they were sort of related to, to, to literature. And, and then the work became more personal and dealing with them. Um, with race and dealing with um, then cultural things. I did a whole rap series just because I was really into West Coast gangster rap and that series didn't go over so well, but I was really interested in it. <laughs> um, and then it'd go back to the personal, like having a, a child with, with autism and doing a series on that or, uh, or gender being trans. And then, um, but it'd go in and out from something being sort of interior. Like now the series I'm working on, I feel is more interior and maybe not so easy to, to, to give like a um, one paragraph description of it. It's more nebulous and, and based on inner, um, just 
inner feelings. I think, I guess you could relate it to what's going on with uh, Corona and how everyone's just at home and looking within. And so I guess I could say that that would sound, <laughs> that would sound good. And my mind's just like, oh, I not, don't want to do anything cultural or political. I'm just really feeling this internal kind of stuff. So I don't know if it's this trajectory that's going in one direction. I think it sort of goes up in some direction, maybe of something that's political and cu cultural and then more within and then out and then kind of like a pulsating sort of um, direction uh, or change. I mean, change is, you know, constant. <laughs> change is God, like Octavia Butler said. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, I think maybe we have time for one more question. And there is a question in the, um, in the Q&A section that may uh, uh, bring us back to um, uh, your impulses. Where, where, where did you get the impulse to become an artist? And I think some of us in the audience may have some ideas about that, uh, but there are others who are interested to, to know a little bit about the origins of the creative spirit that uh, is expressed through the both of you. So maybe we could close out with that as a, as a kind of a final question. I don't know about you, Leslie, but I resisted it for a long time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think my mother, when I was in high school when she first got her first national endowment, and I remember bringing up whatever sorry little paint I had made to my art teacher. And he was like, oh yeah, your mom this, your mom that. And I'm just like, <laughs> no way we're gonna be able to crawl out from this, you know, amazing shadow. And although she's always been very supportive, you know, I think it's really difficult for children of famous artists, famous musicians and favorite, you know, famous writers to kind of uh, find a foothold of their own. And so, you know, I think we, you know, uh, I looked into being an art historian and I don't know if you were looking, you were, you were doing some writing and were looking into other things in music a lot when you were really mm -hmm. young at college. So, um, but uh, I guess I realized I just wasn't really good at anything else. And um, it really yeah. felt it was natural and it was really felt, you know, it was the family business and it was something I really loved doing. So that was sort of my story was there's no escape. I think I had, uh, I was a waitress for one day, got hired and fired the same day, so. <laughs> yeah, oh, so that's so similar to my experience. I mean, because um, our father was an artist and art, did art conserva conservation. So when it was time to go off to college, I was like, well, it would show complete lack of imagination to do exactly what both my parents do. So I majored, um, I went to San Francisco State at Laney and then San Francisco State up in the Bay Area and majored in communications, radio, TV, film. And I worked at a radio station for several years, KPFA and B in Berkeley. I was part of a black collective there called Souls of Black Folk during the 70s. That's how old I am. <laughs> but it was a very exciting time musically and we had Black Panthers and SLA and all kinds of things and all of the communiques were being broadcast from that radio station over there on Shattuck and Berkeley and that's what I wanted to do and then I came back to um, LA and um, and I got pregnant with my first child and was staying home and it's like well I don't really have any somehow in my mind it was like I didn't have pressure on me I just just going to do it because I'm home anyway and um you know, um, and then it just sort of started that way too. And, and sort, of, sort of like Alice, and I don't think I'm, I don't know what kind of other job I could get right now. But you know, the fact is that our mother is a pathfinder. She's so incredible, so just amazing, you know, and to have grown up with her and she always encouraged us to be artists. It wasn't like there was any kind of like she, that's what's interesting. She want, I think she wanted us to be artists. Not that she said you should, but I always sort of got that vibe. And, um, like Allison said, like there's people who become doctors or their parents were doctors. It's just maybe uh, something you feel you can do. You also just sort of see the paradigm of how it's possible, you know, to, to live. And we did not have a lot of money growing up. I know my mom was on welfare. I remember she had that car that was always like burning up and smelling like burnt cabbage and um, like the car never worked. And you know, but still we had a really rich, amazing life, just just filled with beauty, not having anything to do with money. Um, I had somebody say to me once that I was born, I'm like, well, I didn't come from a bunch of money, but we just got a lot of love from, from our mom and dad. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, amen. <laughs> 
Well, I think I speak for uh, uh, for uh, Dr. Bonaparte and myself and all my other colleagues in the Intercollegiate Department of Africana Studies here. We are so honored and thrilled to have had this afternoon with you. And we really want to just give you our heartfelt gratitude for this. So thank you so much. And uh, <laughs> look forward to seeing you again before too long. All right, thank you. It's been a great honor to be part of this. Thank you. <laughs> Definitely. Thanks for your attendance, everyone. Thank you.